Hello, and welcome to Superhuman Samurai Cyber Pod. I'm Rob. I'm Jen Knight. I'm Auntie David, and this month's guest is... It's Trent. Yay! Yay! Trent Trent's is back, back with us! That's right, once more, we are supporting the troop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, that, that joke would have been the background of my high school years if I had been a little younger. Aww. <laughs> I got Troop Day It Is. Wow. <laughs> Ooh, I, wow. I, I guess my brain is really old. I just go to F Troop. I wow, that's... You gotta... David, when did you pick up a case of Boomer Brain? You really need to have that looked at. Well, I, I got, like, reruns of a lot of shit when I was a kid. Even before Nick at Night had, like, everything, I would see shitloads of old TV. I don't... I, don't, I guess my parents <laughs> just watched it, and, and at the time, I did not mind the laugh track. Now I can't stand anything with a laugh track. Uh, yeah, that's why I know who Dobie Gillis is. Oh, anyway. Dobie Gillis must die. As the resident millennial here, I am thoroughly puzzled. <laughs> it's for the best. Before we digress too much, let's pl let's have Trent plug his stuff first. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, I do a variety of things and stuffs. Um, specifically, uh, 3D printing through, uh, uh, prize inside on Shapeways, and I have a animated series that is in the pitch stages called the Dino Guard, which is uh, I've got a Facebook page for that. Yes. That's Dino with a Y. Ooh. Um, and uh, mainly I have uh, I have the uh, 3D printing stuff. Just today, I put up a load of little tiny scraplets that'll bite onto t uh, siege figures. Mm. Ooh, really? and, and I'm not talking like, um, classic I'm not talking, or prime. I'm scraplets. talking OG G1 style scraplets, where oh, they're a, oh, oh, weird, weird little bolts. gremlin monsters. Where there are a whole bunch of little <laughs> random gremlin-y gremlin creatures. Yeah, instead of one stock design. Yeah. Okay, that's really I'm, cool. I mean, the stock design is adorable, but also the OG is yeah, pretty great I've too. I've got. The, the little random guys. Yeah, I got great. a total of 16 of them. Ooh, nice. They're about 15 millimeters tall for the ones that are actually kind of standing up straight. A lot of them are crawling or burrowing halfway through and things like that. And, uh, yeah, that's that's what I've been doing most of today. Nice. Oh, and, of course, there's the Isle of Rangoon, which is my uh, me and Greg's YouTube series, which is uh, of a... It's uh, kind of like MST3K with puppets that we don't use as often as we ought to, because my back's bad. <laughs> Aww. Yeah, p p puppeteering is great, but it, it, it is a trying difficulty. Oh, uh, recently you've also been doing sort of a podcasty thing where you review, sort of, old episodes of MST3K. Yes. Which have been, been going through Mystery Science Theater randomly. Um, not just MST3K, too, because we have some... Uh, some uh, cinematic Titanic and film crew and other stuff like that that we're going to be checking. Uh, but basically, we watch we watch one of the films, we break it down. A whole lot of it is me just marveling over people's internet movie database pages. Because <laughs> um, uh, I, I like to play it as like, did anyone on this ever do anything again? <laughs> and which I. It, it's always a delight when you do discover that in something in a mystery science theater movie. It's like, oh, neat, they did have a career after this. <laughs> the one that, the, like, uh, one of the ones we did recently was the, uh, the amazing transparent man. And that was one that I had, I had pegged as like, no one in this is ever going to have done anything again. Uh, this is clearly going to be a, <laughs> a, a, a Manosian career ender. And, uh, it turned out I was greatly wrong as several of the people involved were extremely prolific cowboy actors. <laughs> uh, oh, well. Oh, uh, yeah, and sometimes you get that. That, that seems to be one of, yeah, one of those things where once you get into it, that's like, you are set for life. Oh, or, you yeah, know, you were back, back in the, the 50s and 60s. I, I didn't realize there were that many cowboy TV shows around. Cause oh. there's, uh, they just keep coming. I'm like, but there were only three stations back then. 
and there's still only 24 <laughs> hours, and they didn't show anything from midnight to 6 a.m. What? They hadn't figured out reruns yet. Where, where did these show? <laughs> oh. So that's cool. Yes. All right. So today's episode is the penultimate episode of Yay. of Gridman Decisive Battle. It's very decisive. Uh, so, okay, I just have a very, very brief anecdote here. Uh, I was at TFCon over the weekend, uh, and I was explaining the show to everyone constantly, like, oh my god, like, I, at one point I was talking to Jack Lawrence, and I noticed uh, there was uh, a friend of the, the artist alley uh, at Die Mooch's table with a Gridman t-shirt, and I just broke off talking to Jack Lawrence to s- get excited about this guy's Gridman t-shirt. Uh, but at, at one point I brought it up to, to Aaron Archer, like hanging out in the hotel lobby. And as soon as I'm like, so basically all the kids designs are, are inspired by shattered glass transformers. And he was like, well, that's not my problem. (laughs) (laughs) And it, it, I, it does make me kind of sad that for so long he had to like approach the sort of homage as like a potential legal issue so i'm i'm glad that it's not his problem anymore anyway <laughs> carry on decisive battles that's right is the 11th episode and uh first uh actually i don't know when it first aired i don't know that data here but anyway previously i did well i wait okay um, december the 16th 2018 oh well there we go yes <laughs> thank you And previously on on Gridman, we've discovered that uh, Shinjo Akane is the uh, is the Billy Moomy of this uh, this particular uh, little cornfield. <laughs> However, she uh, dispensed with the whole godlike powers thing for the climax of the episode, and just decided to shank uh, our pal Utah in the gut. Yeah, so we we start straight with stabbing, and actually, I'm uh, kind of curious, Trent. So you, uh, when you were last on with us, this show was uh, much less of a mind fuck. So, <laughs> and, and to be honest, I haven't watched the intervening episodes. So, um, <laughs> oh, oh my, oh my God. goodness! Okay, I was kind of hoping that was the case. <laughs> wow, I didn't... yeah. So this was a little bit of shock. It's like, oh, since so he just decides to deal with the hero via box cutter. That's uh, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> Boy. It's like, well, this this entire concept escalated quickly. I assume your reaction was much like that uh, that much used uh, community gif of Donald Glover walking into that room with oh. those pizzas that is now on fire. Yeah, well, the 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 thing that got me is that the this is that the episode seems to have taken a despite the fact that there's action happening all the time, they've moved into moody anime zone. <laughs> Oh, it's very moody yeah. and very anime. So it's yes. like, yes, there's giant fights going on that we we will show you as much as we can afford to, uh, as much as the budget will allow. <laughs> but for the most part, this is going to be about the feelings of dis- of people in very disturbing, unreal circumstances. Yeah, I mean, basically, That's like kind of the show <laughs> when you were last when you last joined us. Everyone, all the characters in this show were pretty certain they were actually real people. Yeah, that, that was <laughs> that, that took kind of a well. It, it's it, it's in it's inevitable with mecha anime that eventually you're going to get some kind of mind fuck. Um, it's uh, yeah. especially ever since Evangelion, it's now like required. Yeah. Yes, but. Uh, yeah, at some time, some not some at some point, somebody's got to be someone's dream, and uh, <laughs> all the, and I, I mean, admittingly, I I was kind of shocked and you know uh, shocked, but not necessarily in a bad way, story wise, by the 
attempting to resolve the hero issue via box cutter. Because that's something that the yes. bad guys rarely ever do. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you don't normally go straight for the Avatar, but here we yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. Just... <laughs> I, di- I didn't know you hadn't seen any episodes in between. <laughs> I'm, I, I think maybe... I'm on the one hand completely shocked that, oh, oh my god, we've spoiled the shit out of you. On the other hand, wow, this is a perfect test case. Oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> we've gone from like... <laughs> Sort of happy fighting kaiju with repercussions in that Psych Hill died to the first scene has a lot of blood, which <laughs> Oof, it's, yeah. it's, it's, blood is intermittent anime. Sometimes it crops up, sometimes it doesn't. And this time it's surprising how much there is and how persistent it is. Also, the episode. just the, the existential crisis <laughs> going on. It's, you just find out one day that you're an yeah. NPC. And it's like, okay. Anyway, yeah. I'm yeah. So, so right from crazy. the get go, we know that uh, Shin that uh, Akane has gone into full eerie mode because she's got those Elijah Wood in Sin City glasses. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which I, I guess that is like a that's an anime thing. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. a little bit of the, the Gendo Akari thing, yeah. So so not only well, yeah, does she... It's, it's, it's a simple shorthand for, like, just hiding uh, your eyes. It's like, it, it, your vision is obscured so people can't see the truth behind your glasses. Standard and cliche. And probably, like, distancing yourself from, you know, emotionally from what's going on. Yeah, I mean, not only has she has she shanked uh, their their leader, she also takes the time to before booking it out of there to trash their crappy supercomputer. It's not very nice, man. Of course, no. those things could be kind of durable. So, but then you might have a lot of brittle plastics, and it's I mean not that cool. thing's clearly Don't hanging on by a thread. Yeah. No. Anyway, and, and possibly th- related, possibly unrelated. Um, nobody's phone works. Well, I and assume the internet's down. I assume that is because the kaiju attack from the last episode was not reversed, and so they are experiencing the actual effects of an actual kaiju effect or an actual kaiju attack, which is presumably massive infrastructure devastation and power. I, I'm kind of shocked the power is still on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I guess she probably, you know, she's, look, Akane is in a bad place right now, and she doesn't have time to make sure that the world's internet is staying up. So, you know, she she just needs to Of course, we also don't know how much of an outside world there is, which is presumably why the city is not, uh, you know, presumably why the, the Japanese equivalent of the Marines aren't there. Yeah. So, and, and also, you see in the establishing shots that you're seeing that, that grid overhead sky again, the, the crazy, like, matrix sky again. Yes. Hmm. Grid. And it's not Grid like, man. Grid. <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> like some kind of, <laughs> I oh, also well. wonder. <laughs> now I'm wondering. Uh, the, the, the army equivalent is the, <laughs> Is the Japanese self defense forces or would right? Be. I couldn't yes. think of the name. Why no one's driving mm-hmm. up with a maser or an oxygen <laughs> destroyer or any of number amazing. of things? Yeah. Listen, this is Japan. We yes. have planned for this. Yes, <laughs> they, they we, do. we are deploying gypsy danger. Yes. Oh, I still yes. think that that name is kind of. Uh, oh yeah, that get, is unfortunate. Get rid of the G word, guys. Yeah. I, I couldn't think of any other names from that movie. Uh, Cherno Alpha. There you go. The adorable Russian one that looks like a, a nuclear smokestack. <laughs> That's also kind of iffy. Yeah. Anyway, so he is eventually packed away into an ambulance that I guess somebody just had to like walk and like flag one down. No, or is I, this just somebody's van? I think no, they it's stuck. just somebody's van. That's mom's car. Yeah, I was gonna say mom owns a junk shop. She's probably got a van. Hmm. Yeah, because it didn't have any lights, and he wasn't put into a, a onto a stretcher or anything. He was just loaded in the no, back. 
Yes. Also in the in the credit sequence, there there was previously the hobby knife, and now the hobby knife is bloody in the opening yes. sequence. Yes. Yeah. So a plus <laughs> opening se- when when I watched it the first time through and I saw that I was like, ah! yeah. this was definitely the point where like. At the end of the previous episode where I was like, well, I guess I'm watching this. I'm finishing this tonight. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, also they added a uh, grid night to the opening. There have yes, been minor changes son. over time, Play but this is the like, well, the bloody knife is sort of the most dramatic because it's the most dramatic event. <laughs> yes. So yeah, they're, they're loading him into what is probably a super grubby and, and yeah. Questionably, questionably well, um, sanitized. Considering van. in a previous episode uh, we saw uh, iron hides, I'm guessing Mom drives a um, ratchet without the emergency livery on it. Ooh, that's entirely possible. Yeah. So he gets to the hospital and he is conveniently in a coma. It does appear that uh, she missed all of his vital organs. But but first, as they drive off. My angry trash son is yes. watching. As as a pre tale, I just have to mention that because he is my angry trash son. <laughs> yes, one eyed uh, monster hobo, Auntie, is uh, lurking in yes. the background. Yeah, and, and we see uh, a few. Well, there's a lot of scenery stuff because it, it's sort of stretching out time for a bit to, to set the mood. That this, there's chunks of the city that've been destroyed. The the giant. Kaiju that were more like statues have fallen and there's rubble everywhere. And, and in one of the shots, we see this little black cat walking across some rubble, which I like to think is a reference to Paro from Big O. Also, by the uh, a, a future I episode could, uh, of only that hope. we will probably do as a bonus at some point. <laughs> I love Big O. Oh, uh, I don't know if I can take it. <laughs> but yeah, it's kitty. very, it, I do love a black kitty. Uh, it, it does set a very good apocalyptic mood here. I mean, everything is, they've, they've gotten used to the city getting destroyed, but it resetting afterwards, and it's not resetting. There are brutalized kaiju just lying around because all the background kaiju that were fixing everything have been destroyed, and it's, the world is ending. You know, their yeah. world is ending. It's, uh, so yeah. uh, that, that is something I, I, I'd like to comment on is the general uh, tone and feel of it. Uh, in, especially in contrast to how these types of situations are handled when an American show gets in the same level of apocalypse. Uh, Mm -hmm. and I think this is the whole thing feels like what it's like right before a funeral. Um, Everyone is just devastated and walking around like emotionally half dead and with periodic outbursts. Um, mm-hmm. there's, uh, there's nothing rousing or, uh, rallying about the whole situation. It's just emotional devastation to match the physical devastation, which. Yeah. And there's like Rika decides to to go to school and check on people and there there's that sort of feeling of of trying to you still feel compelled to go about the regular everyday things and you sort of have to take a moment with everyone to to feel out what can still even be done just the the need to do something yes you know right where yeah uh, and like we see sh- when she goes to the school, we see shots of the school that are some of the exact same shots we saw from the first episode setting the mood. But like everything's grayed out and there's signs about conserving water and all the, the like taking shelter and stuff on everything. It's just it's more somber. Right. It's it's definitely like aftermath of a hurricane sort of thing and not, oh my god, we're Americans, let's blow everything <laughs> I, mean, I, I I will say they are handling this in a way that I would not in the sense that, you know, it, it does have that fu- uh, sort of funeral mode, but, uh, you know, going into a funeral, I'm aware that death exists, whereas prior to this day, <laughs> I was not aware that gigantic monsters existed and now there's just a bunch of them all over town. I, I think I would just 
drop dead. Yeah, <laughs> there. I, I would expect more panic from the ci- the citizenry in general, but there's also the the general Twilight Zoney feeling of the of the series. Um, I have right. to imagine that most of the populace has been kind of aware that something's wrong for a while. Uh, even if they can't quite put their finger on it. I mean, the there's a lot of holes in the world. Right. Mm-hmm. Sometimes literally. Yes. Yeah. And if indeed there's nothing outside of the city, then... And no one's coming. I mean, people have to be figuring out mm. that something's wrong there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. I, I better at least find Jennifer Connelly singing Torch Song somewhere. Or I'm just totally going to lose it. Ah. Well, the, the, the question is, like, are they programmed to even know there should be something outside the city? I mean, they're, well, they go on a vacation trip to the uh, the river at one point, but it's like that was just added. That was just an installed update for that week. Yeah, that, that was the expansion pack. And, and, and yeah. now it's gone. So it's like they don't have an excuse to go outside. Or to think about stuff coming out and from outside, they're they're programmed, but they don't know they're programmed. They're just normal people. Oh, you know so what this it's, reminds it's me of? Odd dichotomy. Oh my god, this is just like a Deep Space Nine episode. Oh, like a specific one? Yes. I assume no, you there's mean. a specific Deep Space Nine episode where Odo goes to this planet, and there's this village, and people in the village have been going missing, and he's trying to figure out why. And he asks one of the one of the little people there, one of the, the children there, like about her missing mother, and like, did she ever go on a trip? And he, the kid says, "No, we never go anywhere. Ever? No, we don't leave the valley." Yeah, like that's not a thing. Yeah. Leaving the valley is not a concept <laughs> that they understand. Every, and then she just says, "Everything we need is right here." And but there was that really cute part and and you wouldn't have seen this trend there was a bit a couple episodes ago where uh the the thundercracker girl rather adorably asserts <laughs> that they are going to go on a trip to the sea sea <laughs> oh, yeah so yeah, that, so that... they they do but even then she's saying in an assert she's not saying we're going to go to such and such beach she's saying it You're like she's aware to of sea. To, to the sea so that does sort of oh, like wow, that... the, they're aware of these things, but maybe they're not super fleshed yeah. out. And in yeah, no, they're not because like the, hmm, that may be like the only reference to things outside of the town that I can think of. Jeez, yeah, and it's, depend- it's Thundercracker chair. Depending yeah. on how extensively they're programmed, if they're uh, you know created once, allowed to let go, or if they're constantly being maintained, they might just wander off and then disappear for a while and then get brought back in with vague memories of having gone to beach tm <laughs> uh-huh. i mean part of the theme so far and you know with with auntie being my trash son is that akane is not very good at taking care of her things so whatever sort of you know whatever sort of structure there might be like that is probably not something she's bothering to manage it's just whatever simulation has been set in motion here just running on its own oh entropy is definitely her biggest enemy yeah oh yeah uh, she, she's managing a system way bigger than she can than she should be uh, yes which is probably why the monsters were there in the first place to reset after every kaiju attack because every once in a while the system will start to go on its own <laughs> have a yeah. f- free will <laughs> Oops. Like, no, we have to reset some things. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, with the with the revelation that she's been that she's created this little pocket of the world, to whatever degree she's been making the people, if they're based on real people or if they're just complete fictions or whatever, it does put all her um, her various kaiju murders into an interesting context because every time. Every yes. time one of her creations rebels and is too human and doesn't do the things that she wants it to, she tries to kill it. Because it, it upsets her mm-hmm. that it has free will, even though she's made it have that in the first place. Which you see reflected entirely in in Jen's trash son. Yes. 
my poor baby, he was thrown away. Yeah. It's... I hmm. do love a repeating theme. Yes. <laughs> There's one character that's a discussion for next episode. Okay. But confirmation of if anybody's actually based upon any real people doesn't happen. Oh. But it does feel like, like, like her friend group in the school, it does sort of feel like they're based upon people, at least partially. Mm. Mm. Okay. Like, I mean, who would intentionally come up with Thundercracker Chan? I would, sir. <laughs> I would. Too awesome for human words. Like, th- that feels like she's definitely based upon somebody. Maybe exaggerated because, like, this person is weird and colorful. <laughs> this person is too cool. Oh, also, just imagine, even if yeah. they are based on real people, imagine how weird the world would be if you had to recreate it from your memory based on people you know. Everyone would be totally mm-hmm. wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. E- even the people you are most close with, you would still be recreating a sort of character of them. Right. Um, unless these people have, like, literally been sort of absconded into her little, uh, uh, Realm of uh, dreaming butterflies and such. Yeah. Spoiler. <laughs> well, we never really get an shh, explanation shh, shh. there. Let him think. <laughs> <laughs> I thought. One anyway, yeah, so uh, we get to the school and and uh, Akane runs into. Well, there there's a bunch of people because the school is also like a shelter for when disasters happen. Mm-hmm. So people are congregating there, but. Uh, Starscream and Soundwave, or, um, Hass and Namiko are there. Yes. And she gets to talk to them. They're hanging out. <clears throat> oh. And my again, gosh. they are pretty chill about their, about <laughs> kaiju existing. <laughs> they do seem somewhat, somewhat unperturbed. Um. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're slightly perturbed, but definitely like, I don't know, like when you're young, I think you maybe can deal with that sort of stuff a lot better than when your worldview is already fully oh, formed. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, come to think about it, if, you know, people had just started setting stuff on fire with their minds when I was 16, I would have just completely rolled with it. It would have made total sense to me. Yeah, I mean, that's something that you wanted to totally be able to start happening, except maybe not in the context it ends up actually happening. So, so here's an idea to chew on. So, With Mm -hmm. this whole world being a creation of Akane's, um, does that mean that all of the fictional references are in-universe? We, I I touched on that a little bit because, uh, in, I think, last episode, and it was brought up that, that when, like, Gridman goes, like, full armor Gridman, she complains that he's just a robot, so it seems like she's maybe not actually super into Transformers because I thought it would be, honestly, that would entirely be like when I was a teenager, if some terrifying, like, flame-headed man came up to me and helped me build this this world with versions of my friends, I would totally have just, like, based them on whatever Transformers stuff. And, and so, but... That one assertion that that she seemed to be very strongly preferred kaiju over mecha oh, okay. just made me think that that's that's probably not the case. But it would be really cool. I did want it to just be in character that she was super into <laughs> shattered glass, but saw herself as the Optimus Prime. I think that would be too meta. Oh, seeing herself as the Optimus Prime. That, that uh, well, that. The Transformers aspect feels like it's a meta forced onto the narrative as if, like, Alexis Carob might have inserted that into the <laughs> network of the world working through her. Like, he's a Transformers fan, and she's an Ultraman fan, and the world came out of that. I gotcha. I, I accept this. I accept your headcanon. Speaking of Transformers fans, uh, Hass and Namiko are really excited and took pictures of Grid Knight and Grid Man. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Look at these handsome really robot cute. boys. Yes. I, I almost, uh, if I had had more time to prepare, I almost cosplayed as Hass for, uh, for TFCon. 
uh, because I was on an immunosuppressant and needed to try to wear one of those face masks. <laughs> I was like, hey, I could do cosplay, <sighs> but that was not enough oh, preparation. Sh- shoot, now you got the, the, the idea of group cosplay in my head. Shit, I yes. need to get that Utsumi shirt. Damn it. Yes, do it. <sighs> do it. <sighs> Do it. Hey, TFCon maybe. Toronto. Do Let's it. See if, I, see if I can find a cheaper one. $35. <laughs> or it was more than $35. That's a bit much for a shirt. Yeah. It's a lot of print, though. Anyway. Anyway, this is when we cut to uh, to Akane, who is kind of hanging out on a rooftop, surveying the ruins. Yes, you do. And, yes. And her, uh, her <laughs> mysterious alien demon... <laughs> Butler. Vague evil overlord... Uh, Alexis Carib drops in and uh, tells her, you know, hey, chop, chop, make with the kaiju. So this is something that hasn't been like we, that hasn't been touched on as a potential reference. And maybe this is something that comes up sometimes in, uh, in other tokusatsu stuff that I'm not familiar with. But Alexis mm-hmm. Carib is very much the Kayube from Madoka Magica. Of this situation. Ooh, yeah. Uh, well, that's kind of like, uh, that's what, um, Kilocon, uh, was it Gigabyte or whatever his name was? From the original Gridman, he was just, he would create the monsters. He would, which in itself is actually an odd thing for, uh, Ultra things, I think. I can't. Well, most Ultraman series don't have, like, an overarching villain. They're, well, until recently, they didn't usually have an overarching yeah. villain. But they was he an alien? With people. They were just. Mm-hmm. Was he an alien creature who was manipulating the situation while in a in a seeming position of subservience? Um, because no, that was very Kyube so about it. Yeah, the, which the, the Alexis Carib sort of is kind of, but not really. He's more. He's acting more playful about his nature. Yeah. Right, but but he's still the one who's like, "Hey, let me serve you, and we'll have all these wonderful adventures." And at the end, well, we'll get to that yeah, at the that, end of this episode. Oh, that that has to be in something, but that that doesn't feel like an overarching character. That feels like a, like a monster shows up to a kid and tells him to do something. It's like, "Oh, I'll play along," and until he becomes a yeah. kaiju at the end of the episode but- or something. It feels very, very Madoka Magica to me. Yeah, or Digimani or something. Oh. So, you know, she says, you know, I, I don't, I can't, I'm not making kaiju anymore. I don't want to. And also, there's no Gridman to fight anymore uh, because I shanked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's like, uh, you know, I'll work with that. Yeah, like, hey, but hey, but to remember that uh, that kaiju that you made, and then he went uh, all rebellious on us. Now he's Gridman, so you got to make some kaiju for him to fight. Yeah. Uh, but she still doesn't want. It. No, she's not. She's she's feeling done with the kaiju. She's out of her kaiju period. So it is time to bring back the bosses from the previous levels. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, this. Oh, um, I thought I was that. I thought I was gonna fight Wily. I gotta do the teleporter level. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. That's, yep. that, that is kind of what this is. Um, I'm not sure what the original instance Kaiju of it- roll call. <laughs> yes, the the resurrected monster thing is a cliche, but it's more of like um a common rider cliche or. Power Rangers, some uh, Super Sentai. They sometimes. definitely did it on Power Rangers. It's like we come on, we got to get some more yeah. money out of these rubber monster suits. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's so delicious, though. It's pretty great. I mean that, yeah, because you get the nice tour of every every like of of your greatest hit villains, and they don't have to come up with some some new monster. <laughs> so the the animators, yeah, can well, get... yeah, well, the the standard thing because, um. The, the first, t- well, the first time it happened that, that I know of, it might have happened before, was in the original Common Rider. I, I think it was like a summer movie or something, where they had introduced a new monster, but only like twelve episodes it happened. So they also brought back all the twelve monsters plus the new one in the summer movie thing, Ooh. just to have like, hey, more fighting in in a rock quarry. And, well, 
yeah, like you were saying, like for animation too, it's like we don't have to design new monsters this episode. And we just have to animate. Yeah, them. and they, yes. they're they can spend all of their time animating the big the big like freaking awesome battle. Mm-hmm. Plus, it makes everybody a little yeah. bit a, a little bit less you know disinclined to buy merch of the monsters when they might come back. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah. another nice thing. The, the um. Which is kind of an Ultraman thing, because, like, with with Kamen Rider, to not as much of a degree, but definitely with Power Rangers, like, each series doesn't bring back monsters from previous series. Ultraman does that a lot. For nostalgia, also for reusing the suits. Yes. Like, oh, here, you remember, remember this monster from a couple seasons ago, who used to be, decades ago, an older, different suit. Here is him again. It's Baltan. Everybody clap, Baltan's here, and he's gonna get his ass kicked. Well, <laughs> it's fun. For the longest time, there was the whole thing of, like, uh, in Japan, like, kids don't buy villains. And, mm-hmm. as, yeah, as Toa, yeah. this was the wisdom. I'm starting to wonder if that's just because Japan always kills their villains. I mean, maybe. That, that's part of it, because, like, other than Ultraman, like, Villains yeah, usually don't come back. They're there for an episode, like, other, and then they get... big bads, maybe. They're there for an episode, and then someone stabs them, turns around, they fall over, they explode, and you're on to the next one. Mm-hmm. That's that's a that, yeah. that's a waste of three, uh, you know, of 1,300 yen. Yes. If they're dead. It was yeah. one of the things, well, like, when... Because, like... Oh, go ahead. Oh, no. You go. Oh, I was just going to say, it was one of the things I was always arguing with Fun Pub about. Is they always wanted to kill people off in the stories? And oh, I'm like you can't yeah. kill off the toy you introduced this year. Yeah, that's not that's not. Cool. Otherwise, why are they going to buy yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's kind of the thing. Like, um, I don't know when. Like, like intending to sell, like in the original Gundam, the the Zeon suits were pretty much in intentionally designed, it's like, we're not going to make model kits of these, we're only making them of the Gundam, so do whatever the fuck you want with the suit designs. And then they became popular, and they had to make toys out of them. <laughs> and the Zeon yeah. suits were the coolest. I, yeah. I'm... Yes. Because they got to be wacky, because they didn't have to make toys out of them. Originally. <laughs> well, the villains are always the most fun. Yeah. The Zacrello and the Zeong and... Ah, uh, crazy stuff. Like, fuck, this looks like a blue ogre. The villains are always more fun. They're full of, they're covered in spikes and spines yeah. and they, blades. They're usually a bunch of secondary colors. Yeah. Yeah, they get the, they're, they're colored like poisonous tree frogs, you know? Yes. Yeah. And, oh, and there's, crazy. there's only like five ways to be nice, but there's an infinite number of ways to be an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yes, this is true. You you wind up just getting a lot more fun out of bad guys because what's more fun than the guy that's a jerk and loves that he's a jerk, especially <laughs> when his role in the story is to get punched in the face for that. <laughs> yeah, it is good when they get punched. Oh, totally. Yeah, that's that's the reason in the animated series pitch I have the villains are all undead, mismatched monster, prehistoric creatures, and yes. <laughs> so it's like, oh yeah, that. Yeah, that one's made of tar and evil. Yeah, why not? They're punchable. Yeah. <laughs> Punch them all up. Punch them all up. Their, their vehicles don't, don't just fight. They growl. They bite. They might have rabies. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a dubious sales pitch to parents. So. <laughs> well, come on. I grew up, at, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. How many toys were pitched to us on the basis of how they gross out our parents? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that was like half of them. Yeah. So anyway, they they are besieging the uh, the city. Um, there's nothing that uh, our gang can do because Gridman is uh, locked within uh, within our pal Utah, who's comatose, and the Neon Genesis uh, Evangelion High School students. Are they, you know, they're, they're just accessories. They can't do stuff on their yeah, own. Yeah, they, they have to have the main figure to combine with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, this, this is one of the great disadvantages of your Japanese, uh, cheer on the leader type teams. Yep. Uh, your, uh, your Western type guys, it's like, oh, Superman's down. The rest of us are gonna have to pull together. This is gonna be extra, extra trying, but extra triumphant. 
Over there, like, yes. oh, crap, we're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Goldie Marg's not gonna wield himself. You're super sentai. You have episodes where, like, the red's out of commission, but the rest of the team works, but... So this is sort of more in the Ultraman mold. You have one hero, and if that one hero's not there, you're fucked. Yeah, yep. right. It, you know, if su- if Superman goes down, it's like a worse version of Doctor Who. Yeah, if if Superman goes down, you can't send in Jimmy Olsen to fight Darkseid. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but you but you could send in the other twelve members of the Justice League. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And they they would probably you know they might be able to eke out a victory, but. It'll be it'll be hard fought. Um, it's it's not like either either process either approach is you know good or bad. It's just you get very different narrative tension from each. So now my trash son arrives, and he somehow got into the hospital. <laughs> well, it's an emergency. He's I mean he's obviously injured. He's got an eye his eye covered, so obviously he belongs there. Yeah, if somebody, if he just, this little kid, a kid with an eye patch wanders in the hospital, it's like, yeah, he belongs here. Yes. Something is wrong with this child. If you're under a hundred meters tall, you're not a concern at this point. <laughs> yes. This is true. Yeah. Oh, he's so tiny. And, oh, and the reaction when he gets there, mostly from Utsumi is like, oh my God, who's this? Wait, you guys know who this is? Wait, who are you? Yeah. Yeah, I, I had forgotten that a bunch of people were not aware of his whole deal. I mean, Rika is aware of him as this, like, I mean, she bathed him and gave him a sandwich. Uh, but yeah, she just thought he was this weird hobo kid and Utsume hasn't even seen him like this. <laughs> so, you know, the others are like, yeah, he's... Hasn't seen him at all. He's that kaiju. No. Well, he's, he's seen him as a kaiju. I, I'm with a, a, a Tsume. I I would have punched a little bastard. Um. <laughs> this is. Uh, well, uh, I love the exchange here. Who the hell are you, a normal person? <laughs> yes, I love that. And but then we do get that that existential thing, especially from poor Utsume, who's just he's the secondary character of this story. He's he's the sidekick, and he's dealing with the the angst of being the sidekick, and not even one of the cool sidekicks who turns into armor, like the normal sidekick. No, he, he's so literally he's, just figured out he's Jimmy Olsen. Yeah, and, he's he's yeah. the NPC, and he's upset about that. Basically, just like explaining to Auntie that like when you tromp around as a giant monster, people like me get hurt. So this is a really good conversation. I really love yeah. this exchange. Yes. And Auntie is not terribly bothered by all this, nor has he ever really thought to think about it. No. Also, someone asks him to apologize, and he says, what's apologize? <laughs> <laughs> Which, I, he doesn't understand. Yeah. He's, you know, he he was a monster who was created and thrown out to fend for himself. He He's was a little trash boy. He was almost literally born yesterday. Y- yeah, <laughs> yeah, basically. I mean, everybody was, but they were they I mean, were brought like, in, in in a form of last Tuesday is where they had memories and shit. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like yeah. here, have a feral kaiju kid. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so he basically asks ki- asks uh, Auntie to to please please think of the NPCs who get hurt when you're out there fighting. Yeah, and he de- like he doesn't give a shit about the little people. He doesn't care about stepping on people, but he does comment that he pays his debts because he was taught manners, <laughs> which is two great things coming together. Because like. Being taught the manners he's talking about, Caliber taught him while well, Enrica cleaning him up. It's like, try to be nice. He doesn't still understand how to people, really. Right. But he's trying. He's still a little pissy uh, about it. It's him. one of those arc. But the oh, saying. Go. Go ahead. I'll come back. Oh, I was just going to say, it's one of those traditionally Japanese archetypes that we just don't have over here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, res- the redeemed genocidal maniac. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. it's, it's sort also of like, known as the Vegeta. Well, maybe not. The, yeah, it's the Vegeta, but it, it, we have it to a lesser degree. We have Venom in that an evil character becomes an anti-hero. 
but it's still evil, but it was never made like genocidal murder to begin with, quite. <laughs> right. Even though he's always talking about eating brains and spleens and shit. <clears throat> but the the paying the debts line, another character in the show has said that they pay their debts. Their family pays their debts. <gasps> and Oshiris too. Yay! Who Andy has not met, Uh but he's effectively quoting her without ever seeing her. Uh Aha. Because they're both kaiju. Yes. Good. His, his nice, the, the other little kaiju child. The the little monster frog giant child. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Anyway, anyway so I forget he does... exactly what initiates it, but Caliber laughs. And it's my favorite moment in this entire episode. <laughs> because everybody else is like, wait, what? You can laugh? Mom thinks it's cute. Oh, I think it was when he goes, what's an apology? <laughs> <laughs> and then everybody just starts cracking up. Because how ridiculous is this situation? Yeah. <laughs> But but yeah. we've got a comatose ultra hero, and we got we've got a kaiju who doesn't know how to apologize, and who is basically next in line for being the hero, and is like yeah, and and mom says that she thinks it's cute, so because <laughs> she thinks she's just like sort of adopted that whole crew. It's pretty great. Okay, I got a question: Is she talking about Auntie in this whole situation being cute? Or is she talking about Caliber being cute? I think she's talking about Caliber laughing, being cute. Because everybody's so, like, freaked out about him laughing. (laughs) I think Mom has the hots for Caliber. Well, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And she could do worse. Uh, Yeah. He's a good slouchy... Hey, look, he he eventually learned how to get through doors with all those swords. Hey, they're yeah. all computer programs or simulations or something. Yeah. Who are we to object to them finding love in these strange times? Exactly. Well, so, so whilst Auntie goes out to, uh, to battle this horde of returned monsters, uh, the... Uh, our pals, the uh, the Neon Genesis Junior High students, have figured something out, and they decide to book it back to the junk oh. shop at top speed. Yes, there, there's that. But, um, there's a little moment I like before that, where Boar asks Utsume, you watch Ultraman, what the fuck happens in Ultraman when this happens? And she gets no response, because Utsume Oof. is kind of shut down at this point. Yeah. Uh, yeah, th- then they get the the... Neon Genesis Junior High kids get it into their head. Oh, the kids that are all grown ups except for Boar. Um, <laughs> to like drag, drag Megatron Mama back to the junk shop thinking, oh, we need junk to work to wake up Yuta, which is. Right, because they, they can't fit, the doctors can't figure out why exactly Utah is still in that coma. Yeah, his injury should not have caused him to, to be in a coma. So they're like, yeah, maybe although, we, uh, need we, junk. we get our. We get our vocabulary word of the day, hypovolemic shock. Oh. Ooh, fancy. Uh, that happens when you lose more than 20% of your uh, body's blood That's supply. A lot oh, of blood. Gee, wow. They, they actually did take into account that giant puddle that was at the beginning of the episode. Oh, my God. Jeez, man. She didn't hit anything vital, but she definitely kind of hit something vital. She maybe my guess is she hit like his spleen or something. That's full of yeah. Blood. That's and and yet otherwise not that important to have. So that sounds no. Right. You can live yeah. without it. So that that sounds reasonable. Good job. Good aim. Hmm. So yeah, they they book it back, and it's time for a computer repairing montage. Hey, it's my favorite. <laughs> Which does end up like the the card bore finds. It's a. Optimal 3D graphics animation card with a certain number of colors. It's sort of a reference to the first episode of the live-action Gridman, where they're upgrading junk in the first place and put in a circuit board in there that doesn't have as many colors, because time has progressed. Mm-hmm. Aww. <laughs> and, and meanwhile, Rika has decided to go out and see what is up with, uh, with Akane, because, you know, she may be 
a sociopathic uh, god being, but damn it, we are still pals. Yes. <laughs> and so that leaves Itsumi as the guy who is back at the hospital because he's the guy who doesn't have anything god, else that, to do. Yeah. That part was rough. Because yes. yeah, well, it's it's rough, but the conversation he gets to have with Yuta is really great. Well, yeah, mm-hmm. as a consequence mm-hmm. of the roughness of the situation, though. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. He's like, I, I feel like a jerk because I cheered you on when these fights were killing people. It's like, mm. wow. Um, mind, uh, I'll come. Uh, it, it's a form of deconstruction we don't see a lot. Mm-hmm. The you know when you're no. cheering on these fights with these supervillains, I mean, people are dying in the background. It doesn't tend to come yeah. up unless people are, you know, talking about uh, Man of Steel. That's something that, that tends to get sometimes addressed in dubs. Like, I know there were uh, Dragon Ball Z dubs where they yes. conveniently work in a mention that the city they're fighting in has been evacuated. Mm. So it's, it's something that Japan specifically... And it's on a Sunday, so nobody was in that office building. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, it oh, seems to be something that, that Japan specifically just does not seem terribly interested in addressing, and that is why we uh, we could not see some episodes of uh, 2001 Robots in Disguise mm-hmm. for, for a little while. Yeah, that was... Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's a thing that, that I love that this show brings up, because this show is playing with the meta of, of the conventions, and it actually addresses that in such a great way. Right. It's- Which leads to the scene with Yuta and Utsumi talking about, like, why Yuta has to keep going out, which is in itself kind of a reference to a scene from Ultra 7, where, um, 7, uh, Dan, whatever his full name was, has to go into fight, like he's injured, and, oh, if you transform to Ultra 7 again, you might die. But it's like, mm-hmm. gotta do it. Gotta save the world. But I gotta do it. I'm the only one who can. Which is always, that's, that's some, that's always some good stuff. Oh, but th- this is after, like, all the scenes where Yuta and Gridman are talking to each other in. Yes, they're in the Mindscape. Themselves. Yes, the Mindscape, which it looks like a CRT monitor <laughs> with the, the lines on the screen. It's a nice wonderful. effect. Yeah, I like I that. I like it. Mm-hmm. And, <sighs> and we, we, we get a revelation here, and that is. Essentially, that the Utah we have been, we've met throughout the series is actually just Gridman puppeteering a coma patient, <laughs> which is why he doesn't have any memories. I mean, kinda. I mean, I would say maybe more possessing him. But yeah, yeah, but it's also like they're sort of split until this conversation that Gridman is in junk and separate, but Gridman is also Utah in Utah thinking he's Yuta, but not remembering being Yuta because he's not Yuta because Yuta, actually Yuta has been suppressed and locked down, which comes back to the original Ultraman, which is basically what happened <gasps> oh. there. Like, <laughs> throughout the series... Hmm? Oh. What? No, no, you continue. That That's a way more interesting take <laughs> than what I had. Well, you can come back to if it's a good joke, you can come back to it. Uh, that throughout the series, Hayate, the, the guy who's Ultraman, you, you thought like Ultraman was inside him until the very last episode when Ultraman has to go away after Zoffy helps him defeat the final monster because he almost died, and then you go back to Hayate and or is it Hayato, Hayate, whatever, the guy that Ultraman was in, and he's like. Shit, I don't remember nothing other than a red ball that helped me and, uh, so I didn't die when my plane exploded. So it's the same shit. Like, he wasn't there for the entire series when you thought he was in his body in control. Right. Which is what's going to happen to Utah at the end of the series. Ooh, is there an end of the series? Do they survive? Yeah, they survive. He's okay, and that, that actually serves as a better intro to what I was going to say, which is... Yeah, this all seems stunning, unless you're me, and saw it back in the first episode I watched with you guys. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, this guy's clearly been invented by the machine. Mm, like, yeah. he, he's clearly, he has amnesia because there was no him before now. Yeah. Like, I, possibly it's unclear. Telescoped, basically. From, telegraphed 
from way, way back. Yeah. Yeah. Th- this reveal was yeah. telegraphed. Well, now I feel dumb because I thought he was from <laughs> another dimension. <laughs> My my initial theory was that my initial thought was that there was a real Utah, uh, mm. as we've been calling him, and that <laughs> he got killed in one of the kaiju attacks that worked. Ah, and that Gridman basically just took his identity and filled him in after a reboot. That was my theory back in the day. I could see that. That's not a bad one. Yes. Yeah, see, I, I was fooled by the shattered glass connection, and I thought he was, like, from a different universe that wasn't full of kaiju, and he had somehow ended up in this one. Oh, I... Which is a kind Much like what I thought uh, Cliff Jumper is in the shattered glass stuff. I was pretty open to just seeing where the story t- took me. I, I could definitely see that being a possibility, but I wasn't ready to say that I was certain about it until this point. I wish I could do that. And yet we're, <laughs> we're all probably right because it's not entirely clear. Like there's a Utah body there that Rika finds in the first episode filled with Gridman. How did he get there? We don't, because Gridman did come from a different place, got into a body that was conveniently there. I mean, Utsume um, does seem to genuinely know him. Yeah. Which, which implies well, it been that like, he is a person who existed. He he wasn't killed in a thing. Maybe he was just in a coma. Right. Like in the first episode. Mm-hmm. From a monster attack. I think he was just going about his business and then blacked out, and he's going to wake up a long time later, and very suddenly confused. everyone's going to be like, <laughs> yes, very confused. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, my, that's my take. So, from... Uh, hmm? As, as the person who hadn't watched anything in her in, in between, because uh, you have so many questions, <laughs> not terribly a huge amount of them, but I do have a question about how one thing was executed. Because uh, mm-hmm. in in the story recap, we're going to move pretty quickly to the point where we've got uh, uh, Anti as uh, as Grid Knight, yep. uh, fighting against all the various kaiju. In his new, uh, in his new sweet redeck, uh, you know, uh, paint redeco, uh, Gridman costume. Yes. With slight remolding. I'm, yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering, is the logic behind that, that his whole thing was adaptation? That was his power, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Is it the thing that, is, was the idea that the only thing that could stop Gridman is another Gridman? That, that might have been, I mean, he, he was, I mean, my, my, uh, proposal towards the beginning was that anti is just short for antithesis as, you know, he is the opposite. Mm. Uh, but yeah, he was intended to be a, a kaiju who could mimic Gridman. And in the beginning, he like, you know, sprouts some blades to, to counter him having a sword. And, and this does seem to be the culmination of that, uh, whether that was, ever really Akane's I kind of feel like Akane lost interest before he could reach the point of actually just completely duplicating him beyond just like duplicating his abilities right it, and I I kind of uh, what I like about the that idea is the idea that he has he's done everything he can to match Gridman uh, taking on his powers first, then his form, but also in the process, he winds up taking on the responsibilities that drive Gridman. That's, yeah. that's yes. part of his powers. Is I like is, that. And, and that invariably, I, I, I like the idea of, like, a lot of fiction treats evil as a thing that sort of infects and corrupts and so forth. I always like when when fiction plays with the idea that heroism and goodness is equally infectious. Mm-hmm. That that the villains yeah. who allow themselves to be touched by traces of heroism will eventually be overtaken with it. And uh, I, I like that approach with with Anti becoming uh, becoming Grid Knight because yeah, now he gets to be the brooding awesome. You know, Green Ranger version of Gridman, but yeah, mm-hmm. he's still a hero. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
So I, I like him. Yeah, because I like him like, a lot as a character. Kane created him to like, you, you must copy Grid Man and, and to be better than him to defeat him. And that was his goal to be better and to be able to defeat him. And, and his ultimate answer ends up being, I'll just be better than Grid Man and replace him. Then you won't yeah. need Grid Man. Yeah, I'll just be, I will become him. I'll be better than Grid Man <laughs> by being Grid Man. <laughs> yeah. I'll be the better grid man. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah. So, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's fighting these kaiju and, uh, Yuta comes out of his coma and, you know, sort of talks with Utsumi about how he's realized that he is, he is actually grid man and they get, uh, he turn, he's, he's talking in Gridman's voice. He turns around. He's got cat eyes. I expected to hear Vincent Price laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I get that reference. <laughs> but yeah, poor Utsume here, man. I really feel for this kid. Oh, my best friend's a fiction. <laughs> I hate it when that happens. <laughs> So they, they, they finally, yeah, they, so they have finally got, uh, junk up and running. They, uh, Utah gets down there, does his grid man thing. And also, uh, Rika's mom sees the whole thing. Yes. I love her reaction. <laughs> and is also very nonchalant about this whole I thing. I mean, at this point, she's probably not that surprised. Yeah. And she, she's also acting a little, she has the yellow eyes here. Is there something going on there? I don't know. I, I think she, she, yes, as previously discussed, everybody has like blue eyes except for, uh, Kane, who is reddish and, uh, Auntie. But hers are yellow, so she's the odd outsider, but also her character design is a slight reference to the fact that this voice actress has played other characters in other trigger shows. Like, so right, she- Hence her weird eyeball ears. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's a reference to something from Lucario. I forget the name of the show. But but do do the yellow eye do do the cat eyes mean anything? Eh? Maybe that's up for interpretation. Okay. Third faction. Who knows? (laughs) Mercenaries. I I will say that as someone who came into this blind, I halfway expected her to start to walk over to junk. And start trying various random passwords to see if she could upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do that. I, I don't know if that's if that's anything that was intended from the tone of the the episode or just like what I would do in that circumstance. But I see <laughs> them saying this code phrase and getting zapped in the thing, and I'm like, well, clearly you're going to go over there and see if it works for you. Just yell some things, <laughs> see what happens. That does feel like a joke that almost was intended, but it was cut for time, the way she's acting in that scene. <laughs> God, how how weird would it be for the series to, to end with victory coming because the hot mom comes in and becomes an upgrade scene? That would be amazing. <laughs> that, um, that would be amazing. Oh, maybe she's the giant dragon we never got from the original good man that I can't Ooh. remember the name of. Alas. Which I I don't think is ever referenced at all in the show, which is odd, or they were saving it for a sequel. Or or Maybe. like what I originally thought, like I thought Anti was going to become that dragon, but he didn't. Nope. So he uh, he joins in on this fight, uh as do the uh the Neon Genesis junior high students. Uh most of them stick with Gridman, but uh Caliber uh Lends himself to, uh, to Grid Knight and becomes the, uh, what was it, the, the anti caliber? Grid Knight caliber! Wield me boy! Caliber. Okay. Yes. The, the, uh, the, the, uh, subtitle at least says, use me. <laughs> use me, that was it, I was thinking about. We still doing phrasing? Yes, we are always doing phrasing. And they they make short work of this uh, this batch of rerun monsters. Yeah, there's quick take and... me so I can be red and badass. <laughs> yes, ah, because they're kind of friends, <laughs> kind yeah. of. Yeah, and and whilst all this is going on, uh, Akane and Rika are having a heart to heart, 
uh, amidst this raging battle. And, uh, you know, Akane just does not want to be friends or talk to anybody or do anything. Yeah, she's she's in a bad place. Her world is falling apart. She doesn't believe Literally. that people want yes, she doesn't believe that people want to be her friend. And and so yeah, she's not she's not listening basically. She is in a very she, she's in the proper mindset for some alien creature to come along and turn her into a witch. Uh, yeah, because, uh, 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 Alexis Carib literally interrupts this by saying, excuse me, while I interrupt this pointless conversation. Yes. <laughs> it's such a great image. God, I love Alexis Carib. I need to use that screenshot more often. <laughs> yes. And yeah. And he's like, well, so you're not making kaiju anymore, huh? Well, what if I made a kaiju out of you? And I I don't think we knew this was a thing he could do. Apparently it is. <laughs> and we've seen a kaiju who became kind of a person. We have not yet seen a person who became a kaiju. Like I like I said, this is where I, I really sort of saw the uh the Madoka Magica parallels of this is the point where she's she's been broken and becomes the monster the other magical girls have to fight. She yes. becomes the witch. Mm-hmm. And an episode. and indeed, it does look like she's undergoing a magical girl transformation here. Yes. So, what yeah. does Alexis Carob get from her? That's a good question. Because because uh, really, I mean, he I... needs something from her to make these kaiju. Because he he doesn't like when she says, "I'm not going to make any more." He just creates repeats. He doesn't. Right. He doesn't create yeah. new ones. So clearly he needs something from her imagination or her ideas or her essence to make a kaiju. Right. I think it is yes. answered in the next episode, but I forget what. I Something with a mix of creativity and anguish. I, something like that. Yeah, I mean, it, it does appear that he, he can't actually create. He's just... Uh... He can corrupt, but he can't create. Yeah, he's almost like a power source. Yeah. Like, he's he's not an engine, he's a battery. I mean, that's the thing, is that he needs her in order to, you know, he cannot do it without her her input there. So, yeah, it is like he he requires that a a human, a a young girl's anguish to to get back to Kyube. Uh, (laughs) But, yeah, he he is a parasite. Oh. He's a parasite. And that is where our episode ends. And we get a uh, Rika Akane-centric set of end credits here, which I believe is new. Uh, no, it's the same end credits. Was it the same one? I, th- I think no. it's okay. all the same. It's, yes, it's always been that gay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so it's not just me. All right. Just, just a couple of gals being pals. Yep, just a couple of gals being pals, standing around, touching each other gently. Because and- when she says, when she says, like, Akane, what do you think, what do you feel about me? I honestly expected a turnaround tearful I love you before she got turned into a, into a gaiju. Um. Yeah. yeah. Just to really twist that knife. Just, the, the lesbian subtext also very Madoka Magica. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or text in the case of Mad- Madoka Magica to a degree. Well, maybe not as much as yeah. Nanaha, but you know, close. Yeah. Oh, and, and next week we get to see. Um, remember that shot of that big cocoon-looking thing at the end of the opening sequence? Oh yeah. Next week, we finally get to find out what lies within the cocoon, which was a big oh, is question. It, uh, is it Adam Warlock? Um, I wish. I, I, no. Is it? Is, I, I, what? I think it's going to be some kind of final boss. <laughs> is it? Wait, is, is it Wilford Brimley? Oh, that would be awesome. Star of that, Star of Cocoon. That would be pretty amazing. I, I would love. For there to be a show that had this much intricate work and effort put into it, entirely to lead up 
to a completely random joke at the end, like the end boss is Wolfram Brimley. That that, that yes. would that would make my century. <laughs> it turns out the greatest evil of all was diabetes. Diabetes. <laughs> diabetes. Diabetes. <laughs> oh, sometimes comedy shows do that, but not to that degree. Not quite. And they're comedy shows, and you're aware going in that that's the sort of thing that might occur. They're not going about all dramatic action and then suddenly. Yeah. It, it is, however, not what I ex- thought it was going to be from the, the doodle I did draw in the week in between, which was inspired by... A tweet I saw online, sort of character design, I just took it further, and now I cannot find that original tweet from a Japanese artist, which seems to have frickin' disappeared. Uh, I kind of wish I knew what was behind the name Alexis Carib. Um, like, why that was chosen as a name. Um, uh, ultimately unknown, the sort of a reason is because that was the name they were gonna give to the villain, in uh, Gridman Sigma, which was going to be a sequel series that never got made. Okay. The- huh. How they originally came up with the name? I, I, I kind of thought it was derived from, like, Scarab, like the beetle. I figured it was, like, Cherubim. Okay, because the, the, on- the only thing I know of that has the name Carob is a horrible fake chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, like... That my mother... Carob? Oh imposed upon us as a family oh. for <laughs> semi-religious reasons when I was a child. Uh-huh. Ah. So maybe, like, just the cr- creator back in the 90s had heard of that and was like, yes, that's a word uh, I can use. If you'd ever tasted carob, you'd name a supervillain after it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a... It's like a potpourri bag trying to pretend to be chocolate. It's not... Uh, That sounds amazingly bad. It's wrong. (laughs) It's vile. (laughs) Everything you want from a giant kaiju villain. (laughs) Hmm. Oh. And I I shall not comment on the name Alexis because that is my sister's name. Huh? Uh, uh, I just... Hmm. Yeah, I guess it wouldn't be connected to Alexa, would it, if it was derived from a Before. potential sequel yeah. to Gridman back in the day, which would be in the 90s. Wow. Yeah, yeah. it's a little pre datey Yeah, because, like, mm-hmm. if you were just, like, making fun of, like, that aspect. Um, so, do any of these people exist? I can't tell you. I mean, at this point, I'm not even sure if I exist. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> probably like, an NPC. Because I'm wondering, like, is the entire thing happening in a digital universe uh, at this point? Or is it, like, is there a real world? Do we even, have we even seen a real world at any point in this sequence? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, Trent, spoilers. But the, the, the ceiling digital grid thing is like the grid that was in the original Gridman. When he was fought in that, it was like a glowing neon Tron city made out of plastic that had yeah. a ceiling that was the same color. So the implication, as we see, is that this is inside that digital world. Right. And a Digimon, effectively. I'm very sure. strongly reminded in several thematic ways of Kevin, Kevin the Digimon Emperor. So, <gasps> my favorite character in Digimon. <laughs> no, why? Why was I able to predict that in my head? <laughs> that episode about him made me cry. <laughs> it's like, what's what character from Digimon is going to be Jen's favorite? Obviously, Kevin. <laughs> and she's going to weep when he kicks Wormmon. Ken, 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 the Digimon Emperor. Ken. Sorry, I <laughs> oh, I love him so much. I did. There's the whole episode about like how his brother died, and that's why he was so 
terrible, and also because he didn't actually realize that Digimon were, like, things that had feelings and stuff, and I seriously cried. Oh, that could... I was, I, I'm not, I wasn't watching this when I was, like, seven. This was when I was 20. <laughs> yeah, this was when we were, we're, the, we're, we're of a similar age, and yeah, we were in college at the time. <laughs> yes, I was an adult, and I cried at this, <laughs> this episode of Digimon. <laughs> but yes, it does have very strong... Digimon Emperor vibes of her just like not understanding that any of this is like you know that that her actions are affecting actual people or in that case adorable oh, Digimon. Right, he's from the season I forgot because Tamers was so much better. Oh, I gotta admit, Tamers <laughs> is, is is really awesome. <laughs> yes, it was. Tamers is really good. Best opener. I love that definitely. Season. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. Tamers was alright. Didn't have Ken. <laughs> <laughs> and then he just became a big hippie. Well, you know. Speaking of genocidal villains being redeemed. Yeah, so that does it for uh for this episode of Superhuman Samurai Cyberpod. And I would like to thank you, thank Trent again for joining us. And uh, we are definitely going to have you back on once we start talking uh, robots in disguise. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, I look forward to it. Yes. Looking forward to that. Steel jaw is made of sex. I promise to be way, <laughs> way more prepared for that. Also that way is... more braggy for reasons that... Yeah. This, it's, you know, Yay. it's... It's kind of like how we did a Patreon episode about the Warcraft movie with Rob having no idea what, what, it, oh. it's like, this, that's an orc, right? And <laughs> oh, you, you think I had, like, influence on this as part of, like, the Shattered Glass universe? Check my LinkedIn page. Find out what influence I had on Rid. Anyhow. <laughs> yes. Yes, we will have you back. Uh, they can't claim non-disclosure agreements on your resume. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so until next time, when we cover the the final episode of Gridman, I'm Rob. I'm Jen. I'm David. I'm Trent, but I won't be around for that episode. You'll be there in memory. In spirit. That's right. I'll there just no. match yours, Trent. Mine was a second okay. off because my mouse was moving around and I didn't know what it's was going on. That's okay. <laughs> Matching it at the beginning is not the hardest part. It's just that every once in a while, sometimes they seem to desync. That sounds which is weird. weird. Yeah. Like they'll they'll just be like a second yeah. off. Yeah, I've experienced similar things. It it happens with audio recording for. I am going to reasons uh, that are unknown. Well, I can understand like sometimes with internet speed, but like I th I think the most common thing is I think like. For some reason, Rob will be a second later the longer the episode goes on. I'm it's no because of the longer. Canadian yeah. conversion rate. <laughs> Could be. I don't know. I'm going to blame it's... codices. <laughs> it does seem to be more noticeably Rob. I get, well, I guess maybe because he is the furthest, but... Eh. It's weird. Anyway. All right, I'll stop playing episode toy packaging. No, uh, I got Ratchet. Yeah. I'm very excited. Yeah, I still... Yeah, I don't have him yet. Did you only get one, or did you get enough for the whole class? <laughs> there was only... I only saw one at the Walgreens I was at. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okey Wait, where'd my... Oh, my notes are... My you notes are under a layer of new toys. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that feeling. <laughs> I got another one of those little gotcha Springer to open cat up there, robot yeah. girl things and I actually kind of really like this one so that's cool that's an improvement over two identical ones in a row that I was very met on so okay I'm ready I'm I'm ready to talk about my favorite trash son 
He's literally okay. garbage. Oh, uh, Trent, you sound a little quiet, but I guess I can fix that in post. Or everybody else okay. just sounds loud. All right, so everybody's ready? I'm ready. 